Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last episode, we started a series that looked at the different roles of each starship within Star Wars. We covered the Rebel Alliance last time, so today we're going to be looking at their opponents, the Galactic Empire. The result of an authoritarian military first leadership style, the Imperial Navy and Army was a massive organization that required massive amounts of manpower and resources, even if that meant uprooting and destroying local industry. This meant that in less populated and developed areas of the galaxy, the Imperial military was oftentimes one of the only employers in town. And this was all a part of Emperor Palpatine's plan to replace local economy with the Imperial military industrial complex. When you employ a large percentage of your citizen population to police the other half, you lower your chance of a revolution. This allows you to divide and conquer, and more importantly, keep people working so busy that they don't even notice what's going on. Now, of course, by increasing the size of the Imperial military, they encountered many problems, mostly related to logistics and costs. This is why the Empire usually used low-cost starfighters, which had standardized and modular parts. When you have millions of TIE Fighters, even saving one credit or one pound of Durasteel will ultimately lead to huge savings for the Empire. Now this cost-saving mindset might be counter to what you would expect from a military-first government. But if you look closely at our own planet, this is really just how most military-first nations function. There's also the colossal task that the Empire has to face in patrolling and keeping order in the entire galaxy. Even with their massive fleet of starships and battle stations, they just don't have enough men and ships to watch over everything. And if you were to compare the Empire to the Grand Army of the Republic from which the Imperial military came from, you would notice a huge shift from quality and survivability to quantity and quantity. The TIE in space superiority starfighter is as iconic of an image as the Stormtrooper and Star Destroyer. It reflects the Empire's military philosophy and in some ways Sith ideology, I would argue. This minimalistic starfighter was built for two purposes, speed and offensive ability. The cockpit is one giant sphere and serves as a structural point for the two massive solar panels which collect solar radiation to supplement onboard fuel tanks. The TIE fighter is also equipped with twin ion engines which gives the TIE that telltale scream which somehow can be heard even in vacuum. For offensive firepower, the TIE fighter relies on two laser cannons and lacks any larger munitions like concussion missiles or proton torpedoes. Which actually makes sense considering what the role of this fighter is. The TIE Fighters were usually based on space stations or starships and mainly served as point defense interceptors. This meant going up against Rebel Starfighters and bombers, and at most, pirates in frigates and corvettes, which meant laser cannons were usually more than enough. Given the civilian nature of most of the threats that the Empire faced, the TIE Fighter usually could handle whatever the galaxy could throw in their way. It wasn't until after the destruction of Alderaan that the Alliance to Restore the Republic actually became unified enough to even put together a decent-sized fleet. So, at least in the decades of stability prior to the start of the Galactic Civil War, the TIE in space superiority starfighter was more than capable of doing its job. Eventually, though, the Rebel Alliance started acquiring larger capital ships and also introducing more versatile snub fighters. The TIE in space superiority starfighter started showing signs of weakness. For one, the fighter lacked the hyperdrive, which meant that when a star destroyer or carrier entered a system, it took the Empire several minutes to launch their entire complement of fighters. Rebel starfighters were almost always equipped with their own hyperdrives and were usually already deployed and making their first attack runs before the TIE fighters could even launch. Also, whenever the Rebel starfighters were overwhelmed by the TIE fighters' numbers, they could always jump into hyperspace. The TIE Fighters, although incredibly nimble and featuring a very strong sphere-shaped cockpit, lacked deflector shields, which was kind of insane considering how dangerous space travel was, especially if you consider how much debris is flying around in space. A micro-asteroid, which would harmlessly bounce off an X-Wing shield, could potentially pierce the massive front window of a TIE Fighter. Which wasn't as big of a deal as you would think because TIE Fighters also lacked full life support systems, which is why their pilots were always in full spacesuits when piloting, so they would be ready for explosive decompression of their cockpit. But that all adds up to one thing. If a TIE Fighter space station or a carrier is destroyed, they are stranded in space, and if no one picks them up, they'll most likely die of exposure. Yet still, being a TIE Fighter pilot was one of the highest honors and one of the most desired careers within the Imperial Academy and Navy. The other position would be being a captain of an Imperial-class Star Destroyer. 
Now, the Imperial Academy in many ways was structured like the Sith Academies of old. There were rules and structure, lectures and classes, just like any other school, but there was an underlying kill-or-be-killed mentality amongst the students. Rivalries were just as common as friendships, and betrayal and sabotage were also commonplace. See, only the top-ranking students would be assigned to more prestigious postings. And as we said before, the Empire was basically the largest employer in the galaxy, so there wasn't a lack of talent. And sometimes getting to the top meant even killing or seriously harming another cadet. And as long as you weren't caught, the instructors were willing to look the other way, even if you obviously did kill someone. So what you are left with was some of the most vicious and competitive individuals in the galaxy vying for only a handful of piloting spots. Despite how massive the Imperial military was, far less than 1% of cadets ever became TIE fighter pilots. For instance, an Imperial class Star Destroyer has a crew of 28,000 enlisted sailors and 9,000 officers, along with usually a legion of stormtroopers. Out of all those men and women, only 150 or so TIE fighter pilot positions were available on board. And this is exactly what the Empire wanted. They wanted the best of the best piloting these TIE fighters, which was kind of ironic because despite all of the resources and time they spent training these pilots, the TIE fighters were still basically disposable starfighters and they're pretty easy to die in. Which is why the Imperial TIE fighter pilot pipeline creates crazy adrenaline junkies that are flying essentially a plywood sphere with lasers on it. The Galactic Empire's fighter pilots are basically Imperial Japanese pilots, and the tie in space superiority fighter is the Mitsubishi Zero. Now, there's a reason why I spent so much time blathering about the Imperial Academy and the TIE Fighter Pilot Pipeline, because this applies to all of the other pilots on this list piloting these various craft. They were all pretty much fanatics. As the war progressed and the limitations of the TIE in space superiority fighter started showing, the Empire started looking into some different variants of the TIE, including the TIE Interceptor. Like the standard TIE fighter, the TIE Interceptor lacked shields, hyperdrive, and heavy weapons. It was also mainly used for point defense interception. Except it was a lot better at it. Its sublight speed, although not quite as fast as a stripped down A Wing, was close. And more importantly, along with the two cockpit mounted laser cannons that the standard TIE had, the Interceptor had four additional laser cannons on the wingtips. This meant that the Interceptor could pour out a massive amount of firepower and quickly overwhelm most Rebel Stumpfighter shields within seconds. Now, one of the main tactics that TIE fighter pilots used when going up against Rebel ships was by using their numbers to separate and isolate individual Rebel fighters and then boxing them out into kill zones. The TIE Interceptor had three times the amount of firepower as a standard TIE and could pursue Rebel Snow Fighters all by themselves. Imperial and Republic military historians agree that had the Interceptor been introduced before the Battle of Yavin, it's unlikely that the Rebel Strike Force would have been successful with their mission. By the Battle of Endor, about 20% of the Imperial Starfighter Corps was made of these Interceptors, but it still wasn't enough to turn the tide. In a galaxy where orbital bombardments and naval blockades in space are a thing, ground forces seem less important. But at least during the first few decades of Imperial rule, the Empire was focused more on policing and maintaining stability in its own territory, which meant no orbital bombardment. With this layer of space combat removed from the equation, air power quickly became an important thing once again. The Imperial Army began designing the TIE Experimental Air Superiority Fighter, otherwise known as the TIE Striker. In my opinion, it's one of the most striking and beautiful variants of the TIE Fighter. Now, in most worlds, the basic TIE Fighter was still used for in-atmosphere work, but they completely depended on inertial dampeners and thrust to stay in the air, as they had the aerodynamic qualities of a flying brick. The Striker took the solar panels of the standard TIE Fighter and oriented them in a way so that they looked more like traditional wings that could provide lift. The cockpit was also extended backwards to provide more room for passengers or goods. The TIE Striker also doubled as a ground attack platform. It could drop proton bombs and had four regular lasers along with two heavy laser cannons. With its very aerodynamic design, the TIE Striker could make easy work of any Rebel snub fighter, even the X-Wing, when they were fighting in atmosphere. 
The TIE Surface Assault Bomber was an attempt to stretch the TIE Fighter platform further than it was supposed to. Like the rest of the TIE Fighters on this list, it was designed by CNR Fleet Systems. Instead of having one central pod, the TIE Bomber had two. One pod for an offset cockpit, and the other was an ordnance bay, which could hold a variety of weapons, including proton torpedoes, concussion missiles, orbital mines, and proton bombs. If the TIE Bomber could reach its target, it could cause a considerable amount of damage. But that's a big if because the TIE Bomber had all of the TIE Fighter's weaknesses, which meant it lacked shields and heavy armor. Also, it had very similar power plant as the TIE Fighter, which meant that the TIE Bomber was slower and less nimble thanks to all the explosives it had to haul around. On top of that, it had a larger profile, which made it easier to destroy. The TIE Bomber was basically a quick fix and bolt-on design. Instead of trying to build something from the ground up that was purpose-built for bombing, the Imperials cut corners once again. This is why the TIE Bomber was kind of terrible, but in the Empire's defense, they did have a massive fleet of capital ships, which had massive banks of turbo lasers, which kind of make bombing redundant. Another prototype design the Empire created was the TIE Advanced X-1 prototype. This was one of the first attempts to create a well-rounded ship for the Imperial Navy. The TIE Advanced X-1 had shielding, a Class IV hyperdrive, it also had missile launchers along with dual laser cannons. Its solar panels featured a more efficient and smaller design and created a smaller profile for enemy fighters. The, the Advanced X-1 had a similar flight profile to the other TIE fighters and had the same speed as a TIE interceptor. But ultimately, it proved to be far too expensive to mass produce and only a handful were ever constructed. One of them was piloted by Anakin Skywalker during the Battle of Yavin. The alternative to the TIE Advanced X-1 program was Grand Admiral Thrawn's TIE Defender program. The Chiss quickly realized that the base TIE Fighter models was a huge liability for the Empire. He believed that the Empire needed to create a well-rounded ship that could chase rebels into hyperspace, which was one of the main reasons why the Empire was failing to defeat the rebels because they kept on escaping. The TIE Defender program sought to create the ultimate multi-purpose fighter, disregarding cost and production time. What resulted was a three-wing TIE fighter armed with six heavy laser cannons, a tractor beam, and concussion missiles and proton torpedoes. Combined with a Class II hyperdrive and heavy shielding, the TIE Defender could easily take on multiple Rebel Starfighters and come out victorious. The six heavy lasers meant that the TIE Defender's offensive output was ridiculous and made shields basically useless. Ships like the Interceptor and Defender were heavily armed for this reason, which is also why we see the Rebel Alliance in the later years of the war strip the shields of their A-wings and the armor from their Y-wings in exchange for more maneuverability and speed. But like the TIE Advanced X-1 program, the TIE Defender program was very expensive. And it also had to compete with Project Stardust, aka the Death Star, for funding. And for some reason, the Emperor liked the idea of a second Death Star more than a capable, all-purpose fighter. So there you have it, guys. Those are some of the fighters that the Imperial Navy used. As you can see, we have a very different design philosophy. This was basically a peacekeeping army that relied on a massive amount of very cheap fighters, very different from the specialized snub fighters used by the Rebellion. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button for uh, so you can stay in tune for the rest of the series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.